am Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to my podcast brought to you by my website, teachmetotalk.com, the largest online provider of early intervention speech therapy courses on the internet. And so parents and professionals, welcome to this show. This is a course for professionals, but we're so excited to be able to offer this for free for everybody so that everyone can learn this information. So let's get going with our show today. Today, our number is 436 and our theme or our topic is the best pretend play themes for building language in toddlers and preschoolers with language delays. And so we're going to be talking about two of my very favorite things, play and building language in toddlers that are having difficulty. All right, so this show kind of originated and this tool that I'm going to be sharing with you originated a few weeks ago when one of the email lists that I subscribed to had a post about their five best pretend play themes for preschoolers. Now, anytime I see something for a preschooler as an early interventionist, I start thinking, how, how, how did my toddlers get there? How do we get there? And so you'll see how well uh, these, these topics, when we're looking at preschoolers, what we can do is take that and then back it on down and how when we think about it like that, when we think about our kids in more of a linear progression, we want to get them there as preschoolers. So what do we need to do as toddlers? Uh, that's, that's what I want to talk to you about today and how to think about that when we're determining play themes. Now, one of the things that I always say is, hey, you don't need anything to really teach kids to talk. You can teach language anywhere, anytime. And that is certainly true. However, <laughs> there are some toys and some activities that actually lend themselves naturally a lot better to teaching play skills and teaching language skills at the same time. And so that's what we're going to do today. And we always remember so sometimes when even as we in early intervention, when we start working on play with toddlers, sometimes we get so into teaching the play skills that we forget about the language. And so again, we want to look at, at topics, toys, activities, activities that bring both of those pieces together. Now, communicating always involves at least two people. And so when we have kids that are playing with some of these early toys, they're so focused on the play and so focused on, on the play skills that they're learning and what they're doing that they tend to self-isolate. So that the things that we're going to talk about today actually kind of overcome that because interacting is built into these play themes. So that's one thing that I want you uh, to be sure that you're thinking about. So in this show, what I want us to do is really explore what makes a good play theme? And this information, again, is from uh, one of the email lists that I subscribe to. It's going to be uh, referenced right here on the handout. And I want to go ahead and mention this to you before we get going any further. You can get the handout for today's show. Uh, there from my website and there's a link right there in the post below here on YouTube. You can get it uh, with continuing education credit if you are a therapist and pay your five dollars to get this uh, one hour credit. You can get it with that or as a parent there's also an option for you to purchase this so that you'll have this information. And let's just start by looking at these five play or five uh, characteristics or factors that uh, contribute to making a play theme really, really successful for building language in place. So the first theme is uh, the themes present good play sequences. The next characteristic is themes that provide practice for vocabulary development. The third one is that themes offer prime opportunities for working on language and play together, which we've already started talking about a lot. The fourth one is that themes allow specific relationships. And then the fifth one, they actually had four on that their email, but I added one. And it's that themes that can be easily simplified or expanded. And that's so important for us in early intervention because a lot of times we'll be playing with a toddler or we'll have an activity designed or picked out some materials and we think this is just going to be fantastic. And then for one reason or another, probably some of the things we're going to talk about today, it doesn't really work. And so we want things that we can easily easily and quickly pull back and still continue that topic or that play theme and then move forward as a child is ready. Or we also want the opposite where we can expand it and we can make it more complex and really bump it up so that kids learn even more. So those are the things that we're going to talk about. So I've already jumped ahead a little bit. Let's go back to that first factor and really uh, unpack these uh, characteristics or these factors so that you're going to really be able to decide 
what play themes work and and which ones don't. And then you'll know when you have a miss in therapy with an activity or if you're a parent, when you're trying to do something with your child, you'll understand, this is why this didn't work. Let me tighten up this little piece of what I'm doing, what I'm offering uh, with this child and the strategies that I'm using. Let me tighten this up and see if this doesn't work a little bit better. So let's go back to that first characteristic. And again, be sure to get your handout so that you can follow along. But the first one is themes that present good play sequences. So what's that? What does that mean? So what's a sequence? It just means the order in which things happen. So we want themes or topics of play uh, that have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So why is that important when we're thinking about sequencing? Well, those are just the basic foundational pieces for that. And that's really how toddlers start to think about and process and conceptualize time and conceptualize, again, when they order things. What do I do first? And then what do I do next? And then toddlers can't really keep things going, those seven or eight steps, even like a preschooler with a language delay can, because again, they're not as mature. And so we need to think about that when we're planning our, our activities for kids or our play themes here. Do I have a good sequence of events? What, what's going to happen here? And so let me give you some examples to help you understand that better. So the first uh, toddler pretend play themes, and again, we're talking about pretending in this too, not just, we, we've said play, and sometimes we think about that just being with toys, but we're talking about Again, that 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 next developmental level up where they not only are using the toy, but they're using the toy not and then not only using the toy functionally, but they're going to use that again to do something with you. So there's an interaction piece. And that's one of the things we talked about with the relationships, toys that can uh, and activities that that provide the relationships. But back to the sequences. So uh, let's think about things that toddlers do often in their everyday routines. And so let's just pull something from that. And remember, we're saying that the best toddler play themes are themes that are familiar to them, things that they do every day. So let's take something like sleep. So let's talk about the sequence for pretending to sleep. What would we want a child to do? I'll give you a second to kind of think about that so that you can sort of sort of anticipate. So what, what would be involved in going to sleep? Well, lying down, right? Getting yourself settled to sleep. And then what? Actually sleeping, closing your eyes. And then what do you think would be the end part of that? waking up, right? So that's how a kid would think about going to sleep. So can you see that we have a real definitive there, beginning, middle, and end? All right, so let's let's talk about that. Let's bump it up now to a preschooler. And let's think about a preschool play theme. Let's take something like going to the doctor. So our beginning there, we want a beginning, a middle, and an end. So what? how would we sequence this? So we would have a kid doing what? Going into the doctor, getting some kind of treatment, perhaps a shot or something like like that and then some kind of response now when I pretend play going to the doctor it just depends on what happens sometimes we put a band-aid on sometimes the kid gets a treat if that's what happens at the doctor sometimes it's just you know pretending yay it's all done bye bye go home that kind of thing but can you see how there's a beginning a middle and an end and that's one of the factors that we always want to think about even when we're coming up with what our ideas are going to be for playing you know how can we start this kind of pretend play thing what are we going to do in the middle and then how are we going to end up and if we can kind of keep that in mind that's going to help this add some structure and again that familiarity piece for a toddler who's uh, again this might be the first time he's kind of pretended in this way and so sequencing is really really important there let me say one more piece of information that I forgot to talk about at the beginning when toddlers play and when they first learn pretend play and if you you um, I've got a course for this if you're not really sure what these steps are it's course number 382 and they're actually seven steps for uh, teaching a child to uh, learn to pretend but when we think about this with toddlers usually they do and let's just use this in the example of drinking from a cup because you'll kind of uh, you'll relate to this example toddlers first pretend to do things on themselves or, or actually use the object functionally then they pretend to do things with another person another real life person like you as the therapist or you as the parent and then they pretend to do things with a toy like a character or a doll or something like that so that's something we need to keep in mind too so anytime that we see a child as we're walking through these characteristics and then move on to talk about the play themes anytime that we see a child kind of get lost in going back in uh, uh, I was going to give you that example with a cup so we want maybe we want a child to 
give a baby doll a drink. That's kind of our, our play thing that we're going. We're doing some feeding or, or, or playing kitchen or restaurant or whatever that happens to be. And we see the child move from giving the drink to the baby doll and then still not even really wanting to include you in that kind of play and then he ends up just really kind of self-isolating and taking the drink by himself and then that's when you'll know oh he may not really be understanding what we're doing here and that's not to say that kids aren't going to pretend to drink like as we're playing restaurant or as we're playing kitchen or whatever else we come up with to play of course they're going to be pretending to do those things and of course we want them to do it but I just want you to keep that in mind if you're using characters or using things like baby dolls that we're going to talk about when we see them lapse back into more isolated solitary play we know we've got to pull that back because again we may not have the language support there that they need to be pretending uh, or or there may be again that that social interaction piece is missing but that's something that I want you to keep in mind so uh, we talked about sequences and how important they are and again sometimes that's why a toy doesn't really work for teaching play or language so let me give you another example of a play theme or something that a toy that we might be using with the child that it doesn't work let's say a child really is into uh, maybe a spinning light toy and so he has it there with you and you think this is great he likes it he's going to stay with me he's going to want to do this with me but then what happens what is what is what's the sequence for uh learning how to play with a spinning light toy there's really just basically one right push it and you turn it on and that's it and then the light goes off and then it's over that's not very much of a sequence it is but there's not a lot to talk about there i mean you can talk about on and off so you can do some prepositions there you can talk do some pro nouns with uh, my turn your turn you can certainly do that which will probably not end well because we know toddlers who uh, sometimes are so into those kinds of toys that they again just really start to stem on that and and you don't get much of that interaction back and forth they're not really talking to you beyond that and so that would be an example of a bad play theme and again we're going to talk about vocabulary that's our next factor there's not a lot to talk about there but even with uh, that spinning light toy the, the sequence is what I want you to think about with this one. There's no real definitive beginning, middle, and end. So think about that sometimes. Maybe you're playing Legos with a kid and you think, he's just not talking to me at, at all. That's why. He's into constructive play. You really, there aren't enough, there's not enough support there. There's not enough to do, you know, and that's what the sequence really is. What are you going to do when you play? And that's what a lot of times parents will say is, you know, I'm just not as creative. I can't really come up with these ideas. I don't really know what to do. Once we've pulled these things out, I just sit there and kind of follow his lead and then he doesn't know what to do. And then, you know, we're just kind of stuck there. And so this is my point. If you start to think about, I'm going to plan this sequence or I'm going to plan what we do before we even start to play. You're going to be a lot more effective because you're going to be able, able to guide the play a little bit better and then you're going to know where you're going and then after a while the child really gets attuned to this too and especially when you use these familiar themes that, that we're talking about like going to sleep or like going to the doctor those are things they've done before so they anticipate it once you get that going they anticipate what's going to happen next and again that just makes it flow better and remember what we're looking for here is to build language and not just that imitation piece which we would get back with earlier kinds of play constructive play or that beginning functional play and that's when kids really do sometimes we don't hear as much language from them because they're like I said before so focused on learning how to play and so again when you think about these things what what really is going to work to help a kid talk you want to include as many of these interactive themes as you can once a child is developmentally ready because that's where you're really 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 going to build your language all right so we tweak those sequences as we go to to increase the complexity so we're going to talk a lot about today like i've already said i've already given it away one of the toddler uh uh, one of the preschool play themes is restaurant and I started thinking about okay how can I back that down for a toddler well that would be you know playing with kitchen or pretending to cook or some kind of food prep sort of thing or feeding a baby doll those kinds of things and so when we think about that when we think that this child is not staying with me he's not he's 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 running away from me sometimes it's that we need to again bump it up a little bit and add some other steps and that means uh, tweaking our sequence there so that's my point about that I just want you to think about that with toddlers we're going to keep these sequences super simple super predictable 
But with preschoolers, we're going to make it a little more challenging because, again, they have uh, bigger language uh, vocabulary bases to pull from. Uh, they're Tip, hopefully, even kids with language delays are saying more as a preschooler than they did as a toddler. And so, again, this is a great way to think about how we can increase that complexity is looking at the sequencing. All right, let's move along here. Two, the second factor, themes that provide practice for vocabulary development. And again, this is our bread and butter as speech language pathologists. We're always thinking about the new words that we can teach uh, children when we're working with them. And so we want themes that offer natural opportunities for lots and lots of things to talk about so that we give our little friends with language delays new words to learn and uh, different contexts. So this is what we need to focus on when we see that a child is kind of stuck in his core vocabulary. Now, I was having a conversation yesterday with my very favorite new therapist, uh, my daughter, and she was talking to me about this. And she was saying, you know, mom, one thing I've learned, that, and she's started a new position in She's talking about all the new kids on her caseload. And she's saying, these these kids, they seem, you know, I, I, now I'm starting to know their core vocabularies because they're saying the same things to me now that they said, you know, when I first saw them three or four weeks ago. And so we were just talking about how challenging that is for uh, preschoolers with language delays to really continue to add new words because they, they kind of talking has been hard for them and so they've established that core vocabulary and they know these words and they use them and so that again they kind of stick to that and that's that's just one of the markers of a kid with a language delay is it's really really hard to keep continuously adding new words and so that's one of the things that we want to think about uh, as we move along with kids during therapy is are my play themes here promoting vocabulary development? Are these new words that I can teach this child? And again, for, for lots of kids, and especially kids that are down here still at the phrase level, so if you're working even with a preschooler who is at the phrase level, you know, really he's still a toddler language-wise. And so we want to really think about Think about that and think about the kinds of words that we're introducing with that and make sure that we're matching where a child is developmentally. Um, and so we need to really, uh, really, really uh, be super careful about that. And, and that may be one of the reasons that some of our kids aren't moving along as quickly as we would like is because we're we are letting them kind of stay stuck there in that core vocabulary and so for a lot of these themes you can use a kid's core vocabulary but then expand that and again how do we do that we always are teaching new word forms and we always think now this is a review for you as SLPs you know what new nouns am I teaching what new verbs am I teaching what new prepositions or location words am I teaching what are my descriptive words here so my adjectives and my adverbs and then what are my pronouns and so really as SLPs Piece. Even if you are the kind of SLP who still kind of flies by the seat of your pants, and boy, have I done that for a lot of years, and how you plan therapy is what you put in your toy bag or what you pull off your shelf right before the kid gets there or whatever a child has in their home, you know, this is the thing that we need to think about too, though, with, with vocabulary you know, development, you've got to give them new things to think about. So if you're using the same old things all the time get yourself some new things to do introduce some new things for the child even if they're kind of stuck and even if they have their preferred routines and you can't get more beyond that think about what new steps like we were talking about in sequences and uh, back in sequences and then now in in vocabulary development think about what new words you can do with that so let's let's contrast let's, let me give you a good example and a bad example like we did uh, back when we were talking about in factor number one with sequencing so with vocabulary development let's just use that same example that we did with that spinning light toy and I sort of started that already for vocabulary development if that child is already saying on off or requesting a turn with please or more or mine or whatever word he uses for that or you know even an exclamatory word like we or what once they get beyond that what are you really going to teach with that spinning light toy there's not too much there so as far as vocabulary development goes that wasn't a good choice either right let's compare that to something like a farm set so think about all the different nouns that you can teach with a farm set you've got your names of your animals you've got your barn or your tractor, your trailer, whatever little props you're using along with those animals. You have your verbs, you know, you're going to think about what all those animals can do, and you can think about it in terms of what the child does, which is what we're going to do with our, our with toddlers with uh, familiar play themes. So verbs like eat and drink and sleep, and then you've got your actions, you know, ducks and birds, and your chickens on the farm can fly, and your cows and horses can walk, or they can run, or they can sit, or they can jump. So that's how we 
play in the vocabulary. We look at our toys and we think, again, what new nouns can I get with this? What new verbs can I get with this? You know, what are my prepositions with a farm set? What can I do? Well, with a barn, you can put those animals in and out of the barn. You can put them on top of the barn. You can take them, you know, again, up and down. Uh, and so look at that with every single activity you're doing and pre-plan what those new words are going to be. Now, what I do with that kind of thing is uh, if if I'm just still at a loss there, sometimes I'll even take a vocabulary list, say one that you've gotten from one of my therapy manuals, like teach me to talk to the therapy manual, or I think there's probably a vocabulary list in every, all six of my therapy manuals. Sometimes I'll just take one of those vocabulary lists and look at what, look at the toys that I think I'm going to do that day and think, you know, what, what words can I pull out from this list that, that I might not be thinking of? Or sometimes with parents, the, the reason that we do that is because they're choosing words that aren't really developed appropriate and so a child maybe has a 10 word vocabulary and then they're trying to teach a pronoun that's later developing and again you might say well that's naturally occurring that came up a parent should do that kids who are typically developing you know that's what we would do with them too yeah but these are our little guys with language delays and so we want to make things as just as easy for ourselves and for that child as possible and so that's why using a vocabulary list like that is a really good idea especially when we're kind of at a loss of what where we should, should go next with vocabulary development. All right, so we talked about that. We talked about uh, vocabulary development there, and we really need uh, themes that provide opportunities to teach kids to understand and use new words. All right, before we move on, if you're new to my podcast, we've gotten so many new subscribers lately. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist. My website is Teach Me to Talk. Welcome here to our YouTube channel. If you feel that you've benefited uh, from the videos here on our channel or uh, our website, I'd like to ask you to please consider purchasing the PDF for this show. It helps so much uh, us to continue to provide these videos, especially for parents who can't afford that. So thanks so much if you would consider that. Now, I want to say thank you to all the parents and grandparents who are already supporting our work in this way. All right, so let's get back to factor number three, our third factor here. And these would be themes that offer prime opportunities to work on language and play together. Now, Carol Westby, is my favorite researcher in this area. She's a speech language pathologist, and she's written a lot about play and how play and language, again, just marry so nicely <laughs> for working with our little guys with language delays. And so when you think about play, a child's play skills uh, a child's, let me say it right, a child's language skills will never be higher, never outpace his play skills. Now, we'll see a lot of kids as toddlers who play a lot better than they talk, especially our little guys who have, <clears throat> they just have solid expressive language delays, or maybe they have uh, a speech disorder, even like apraxia, but their receptive language is good and their play skills are good. And so they may be doing all kinds of complex play, but their expressive language or what they say can't keep up with that and so some kids though really are kind of the same with that and so with their language skills and their play skills and so when we think about that we want to keep we want to keep kids right there at that same level so we always want to bump up those language skills to meet a child's play skills where we are and we think about that a lot with expressive and receptive uh, language delays too toddlers always uh, whether the, uh, uh, Typically developing toddlers always understand more than they can say. And so that is a real typical pattern, but a lot of times they're little guys with speech delays. They understand a lot more than they can say. And the uh, and again, that's an even bigger the gap there because their expressive language is so delayed. And so we, we think about it that way with I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this gap between their expressive and their receptive language. And so we need to think about that with play skills too. When we have a kid whose play skills are fantastic, and that that's, again, ideal, we want to really think about, let's get that language bumped up to match that play. And sometimes, again, we have kids who uh, their language is never, ever going to be greater than their play skills. And so when we have kids whose play skills are really, really delayed, and let's say they're not doing any pretending at all in their over 24 months, or they're not joining any ideas at all in their over 24 months, we know that, that we've got more work to do there, too. 
too. And so that's what we're talking about it, with play is that we play really is the best way to measure a child's cognitive skill development. You, it's the best way to measure what a child knows. And so when we know that a child is doing lots of sequencing in play, meaning he can put a lot of steps together in play, he doesn't just, you know, uh, pretend, he doesn't just take a tractor and roll it across the floor. He puts a little man in the tractor. He puts a cow in the back and they drive the tractor, but then guess where they're headed? He heads it over to the barn. He, The man gets out of there, the farmer gets out of the tractor and he gets the cow out and puts it in the barn. That's a lot different. That's a, that's a lot higher level play skill than say a toddler who's just laying on his belly on the floor, rolling his little tractor back and forth, right? And so we think about that here with play. We got, for a lot of kids, we have to bump up their play so that we can, uh, get that cognition moving and get that receptive language moving so that their expressive language skills will increase too. And so we have to remember play really is the nonverbal piece of language. It's that cognitive piece and it has to come first. And so that's why for so many of our little guys, especially those with cognitive uh, issues, our little guys with auditory processing issues, they understand words, but then you try to uh, get them to follow directions or get them again in sequencing and they just get lost in all of that because all the language really uh, is overwhelming for them and they can't process it uh, all. And so we have to really think about uh, helping kids understand those concepts non-verbally first before we teach them how to say it. And so when we think about play themes, play themes that really uh, join teaching play skills or solidifying play skills, strengthening play skills at the same time as we're building language skills, those are just ideal. And so I've already mentioned mentioned uh, Dr. Westby's work. So take a look at her work, the symbolic play scale has been a really important piece of work for me uh, to use as a reference in my work as a speech language pathologist and at Teach Me to Talk because it really does look at where a child's play skills are and then where his or her language skills are. And I've based the stages of play that I've developed on Carol Westby's work. And so if you haven't taken a look at that, that's in uh, the Autism Workbook and in Let's Talk About Talking, but it really walks kids. I, I just, I, my uh, stages of play, I've just taken it through 36 months months since that's what we do in early intervention but <clears throat> you might want to take a look at that to help yourself understand again where kids fall developmentally with play and really uh, for some of our little guys they're not even as toddlers with language delays they're not even really ready for some of the things that we're going to talk about or if they are it's going to be so simplistic for those kids because again cognitively and receptive language wise they're just a lot lower than where uh, expressive language wise you may want them to be or maybe trying to uh, maybe your play theme is is has so much language that again they can't be successful with that. We have to build those play skills. And so that's certainly something that we need to think about. Um, I also want to say another uh, another uh, point under this consideration and this factor with we like play themes that can combine toys, <clears throat> pardon me, and play with language is play is a much, much, much better way to target vocabulary development, like we've already mentioned today, uh, than, as compared to other methods like using an app, sitting down with flashcards, or even a book. And why is that going to be? Because when we're using an app or flashcards or a book, that information is primarily visual, and that's fine. And some of our guys have really just that, that's their strength is visual processing things they can see the things that they can look at versus auditorily but things that they can hear but what's the problem with that language is really an auditory system <laughs> so we need that you have to hear it first but and you so that you can understand what somebody else is saying to you and then you're going to speak and so when we're missing that with something visual that we're teaching you know like using flashcards or using a book or using an app and again those things work but kids are not going to get the practice with play and the practice with doing something and again that's how we know that toddlers learn best is by doing something uh, they're gonna they're gonna do better with toys and with this interactive play rather than uh, th those other things play here I like to think about that as the demo part it's what a child really shows us when he under when we see that he's playing that he really really understands what we're talking about and it's not just that he can label let's say that we're gonna play pet shop with the kid it's not just that he can label all of the animals that he could take your flashcards and say you know, dog, cat, or whatever animals you're going to use for your little pet shop play. It's beyond that. It's being able to talk to you about it, being able to, and, and again, interact with that. And so that's certainly uh, something we want to keep in mind with the theme. So all the themes that we're talking about today pair play and toys and language so nicely. And so it's so important to think about toys. And sometimes, you know, we'll think about 
trying to play uh, without props. You know, let's really, really help a child learn how to pretend. Let's let's don't give him anything. And that's not the best strategy when we're doing this with language uh, delayed kids. And that's because we don't always know that they have the cognitive basis to be able to pretend. So with toddlers especially, we're going to need them to have a lot of props and a lot of materials at the beginning to make this play uh, a lot easier for them. And so uh, I have some uh, great toys that I've picked out that go with these themes later and there's going to be a post uh, in the YouTube description so look here below the video for the post with the toys that I've picked out that kind of go with these themes if uh, you want some help picking those things out or if you just want to see what kind of toys uh, that you might be able to pull from your own uh, toy inventory there or from things that you just have uh, there in your home so take a look at that so you can see if you can match some of those all right let's move on to the fourth theme here the the fourth uh, factor that makes a play theme really good would be themes that allow specific relationships. All right, so why is this important? All the play themes that we're discussing are going to have roles. And remember what we said at the beginning about communicating. Communicating always involves how many people? at least two and so when we give a child a relationship or a role during play we're going to naturally create those opportunities to talk and talk to each other and so we might think about this in older kids let's say if we're thinking about our preschoolers who might be uh, playing superheroes one kid's going to be superman one kid's going to be batman another kid's going to be robin you've got those roles there but sometimes we don't think about this when we're playing with toddlers and so relationships in play start a lot earlier and so uh, we need to think about that. So even as we're playing something like kitchen with a kid, we'll need to know who, okay, or or let's use the, one of the preschool themes, restaurant, if we're going to play restaurant with a kid. What are your roles there? What are your relationships? Well, you're going to have somebody who is the guest or the diner. Then you're going to have somebody who's the, the server, right? Uh, if there are more than two of you there you might have somebody who's also going to be cooking or preparing the food right or it's probably if it's just you and a kid the uh, server person's going to do that part too and then the person who's the diner or the guest is just going to do the eating and the reacting and all of that but we need to think about that even as we back that back down what is the kid's role here what can he be quote unquote pretending to do and so sometimes we don't spell that out clearly enough even in our own minds when we're playing with kids. And so naturally we'll think about if we're playing baby dolls with a kid, what is that child's role? What is, who, who is he pretending to be? Who is she pretending to be there? And so sometimes we don't do that, you know, oh, you're the mommy, this is your baby, you're the mommy, or you're the daddy, you're the baby's daddy, you're the daddy, here's the baby. And we don't, we don't even think about that. So we don't think about conceptualizing that or even saying that so a kid can start to think about that too. And so we want to be sure that we're thinking about those roles and relationships in our play themes. And if we don't have any, if you think, oh, let's go back to that spinning light toy example is there a role or a relationship uh, that you can think of in uh, that kind of play versus like we talked about the example we just gave with restaurant or let's use pet shop or vet what are the roles with the vet if you're pretending to go to the vet well, you've got the vet you've got the person that brings the animal in and you have the animal right and that would be completely different we've got uh, three different roles there or three different characters there versus when we're talking about that spinning light toy and so sometimes uh we need to look at that and think well that's why this isn't working and that's why it's not talking to me very much because there's no natural exchange built into this activity there and so let's think about some of this too even with some other uh, common play themes for toddlers you know we've been talking about things like uh, let's talk about cars and trucks or trains or something that uh, we see a lot of our little guys in early intervention kind of fixate on, especially our little friends with autism. So it may be harder for a child to talk during play like that because there's no real reason or no real relationship to explore there. And so when you have cars and trucks or like trains, certainly if we have trains, now let's just go ahead and say something like Thomas. If we're playing Thomas the train with the kid, well, we have some relationships there because we probably have Percy, another train there, and Jay 
games and other train there, some other other things. And so there are even some relationships there. But even when we're playing, say, cars and trucks with a kid, sometimes we can't get them to talk to us, you know, beyond the my car, your car, my car's going to do this. What is your truck going to do? That kind of thing. Because there's no real relationship there. And so, again, that's fine. And that kind of play comes first. But play like that really can promote more self-isolation. So when you have a child who does have enough vocabulary to talk to you and who you are trying to get those conversational skills going and more, again, more than just that little phrase. These are kids who would be developmentally ready to bump up. Again, you know, phrases and beyond that. Sometimes you might think, gosh, it's it's my, it's my what I'm choosing for my material here. It's just not, just doesn't lend itself. It just doesn't promote that natural back and forth there. Now, another thing that we can do, and, and let me say this, it makes play a lot more parallel for a kid than cooperative. And so when you think about when a kid is in parallel play, what does that mean? It means that he's just playing alongside another child. And at the beginning, they don't even talk. <laughs> they don't. And if you haven't watched that in a while, find yourself some kids to watch, some one and two and three-year-olds. And you'll see three-year-olds are usually moving more toward cooperative play. But a lot of times with, with kids, even though they're they're all playing together, say, in a in a pre, uh, daycare environment, you'll notice that they're not really doing anything. They, they may or may not even visually give some attention to another child. And so you need to think about that as a therapist or as a parent when you are playing with your child like that sometimes they just kind of go into that parallel play like they would with another child and what are you supposed to do well with parallel play you're supposed to be there there with them and kind of do the same thing that they do and, and again there's no real talking going on and can you see that that's the problem and so we need to provide play themes that move beyond that so that they're not so self-isolating with that all right another thing that we can do here to make our themes when we see that the relationships when there are relationships but we're still not getting as much as we would like especially variety kids kind of seem stuck even in in these uh uh, really common play themes, switch roles. So if you have a child that when you play kitchen or you play, uh, he's preparing you some food even before you kind of get to the restaurant phase or whatever little ice cream shop or whatever you're playing there, uh, switch roles. So whether if he's always been the person that takes the order and prepares the food, then you have him be the guest and you be the person who takes the order and prepares the food. And so that's certainly something uh, that, that we can do. It's so interesting to switch roles and kind of see where a child is with that and kind of see can they do that can they code switch like that and and be that other role and how how quickly can they do that and adapt and you'll see kind of their little wheels turning I, I think it's so important to get that idea or get get an idea of how kids uh, can do that our toddlers and preschoolers especially when they're talking pretty well and have been on our case slides for a while and maybe we're looking for a way to sort of again change things up and 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 bump things up a little bit changing roles and some of your your things that a child you know let's say he always likes to play uh, Batman with you in your office and you he always has you you know be another superhero next time say hey I want to be Batman today or you know what whatever that is and so again it, as a parent sometimes that's harder to do too you might say you know I, I want to be the person taking care of the baby or I want what, whatever whatever if your child is always locked into that role see what will happen when you'll you'll have him switch that all right so then the uh, last one that I've already sort of talked about what makes a good play theme uh, would be themes that can be simplified and expanded pretty easily and by this I mean on the spot <laughs> so I talked about this already sort of in the introduction that when we're playing with a toddler with a language delay and he is just shutting down on us sometimes it means we've got too much stuff out here he's so into exploratory play and in figuring out where everything goes and how everything works and da 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 da, da that he really can't do anything so we would need to simplify that play or give him time to process and just think well today we're just working on play today we're just going to play i'm just going to see where we get with with this and see see what i see new here even non-verbally sometimes kids need a, an opportunity to do that before we uh layer the language on there but my point is, we've got to be able to, again, uh, when we see that we're losing a kid, is it because it's too hard, and in that case we need to simplify, or is it because it's too easy, and in that case we need to expand or make it a little bit more complex. And so we need to think about that with our play themes with kids in the, this way, especially you know with kids, again, when there are participation problems. That's the main time we want to think about uh, looking at these kinds of factors and what do I, what do I need to change. And so again, sometimes it's that we need to, 
instead of having 25 different plastic foods and four or five options for uh, pans and plates and utensils and all the things sometimes for those kids when they're just lost like that just pull it back just pull it back to i'm going to have one pan two foods one spoon and that's all we're going to play with the kitchen set today and so i think that's a really uh a better way to do it. All right. So, uh, oh, it can go the other way too. Sometimes a family will have super limited resources and they won't have very many toys. And so there might just be a baby doll and you're trying to work on getting the child to expand language and conversation. And so there's not enough for that child to do. So what are we going to have to do with that? You can't always just bash parents about not having enough resources for their child to provide those kinds of new things no you're just going to go help mom and talk about that and pull things from a family's home and say hey look i think this kind of play is going to be better if she has some other things to do with it so let's go in the kitchen and get some little plastic uh, uh plates here or maybe even her little spoons and cups that she uses or let's go get a blanket or a towel that we can pretend is a blanket to use to help this baby doll go to sleep and make that play a little bit more realistic and so those are things that we want to do too props are so important in play and they provide concreteness that so many of our little friends with language delays really really need to be able to understand and process those words all right so that's how we select those good play themes those five factors let's run through them again one more time we said we were going to do sequencing i hope i can remember them <laughs> let's look back at the handout we said we were going to do we were going to think about play themes always have good play sequences they provide practice for vocabulary development they offer prime opportunities to work on play and language together good play themes offer uh, relationships or roles built into the play and then the last one we said they're going to be simplified or expanded so uh, this may really really help you in figuring out your kids that you're working with on your caseload right now that you really can't get to stay with you or play with you for any amount of time and so think about that think about what can i do how can I tweak these things? Have I not been purposeful or intentional enough in planning this play? And so I'm going to give you a tool to use to do that in just a minute. But let's get through some more of these other things first. We've talked about the theory. And so now you know what may or may not be uh, contributing to your effectiveness or lack thereof when you're trying to get a child to play and talk to you. Let's move on now and talk about the specific play themes that work best for teaching play and language together and uh, I want to say one other thing too about pretend play. Now we have to remember that play uh, develops in a sequence and that we're going to be talking again about pretending. And so when does that sort of, when does that come in and typically developing kids? Usually they start to pretend and start to do some of these roles between 18 and 24 months. And so uh, again, that just gives us that point of reference there. And so that's about the time when. So when we think about that, it's when kids start to do this kind of thing. What else is going on language-wise? They're starting to, in typical development, starting to combine their words into phrases. So they're starting to join ideas. And so this is an important point for you. If you have a little guy who's not joining a lot of ideas in play, there's no way that he's going to be ready developmentally to join words for phrases in language. And so just let that sink in a little bit because sometimes we don't process like that like we should as early intervention SLPs. We'll try to bump a kid up to play or to language too soon. You know, we think, oh, we need to be working on phrases here. And we haven't really, really seen that he can't do that developmentally yet. And so we need to think about that and think about, you know, is his language level at a 24 month level yet? Uh, no. Is his play at that 24-month level yet where he's joining ideas? No. And so, again, you know, he's not going to be ready for these kinds of things yet. I've got to move in there. I've got to look at where his play is. And really, the play that, that where kids use a lot of single words and are learning a lot of single words are going to be with themes that are a little more simplistic than this. And things that we talked about before, when we're looking at our stages of play, they may be, you know, again, like we would know with a typical development, exploratory play begins early and continues you know uh, to about eight months at about eight to 12 months they start non-functional play and so our our babies of a typical developing language talking at eight to 12 months not really they're babbling they may say a word or two but they're not really talking they're certainly not conversational and then that beginning functional play that begins 12 to 15 months and then uh, continues and then early symbolic play to, which is what we're talking about these early pretend play themes that really does begin around 17 to 18 months so you can see if you've got a little guy who like 
play is back here solidly here in this non-functional play that's where we're going to be teaching and beginning functional play that's where we're going to be teaching kids to use lots of single words and so that's my point is their language is going to be where their play skills are and so you got to think about that too all right so i said this before but let's talk about this one more time before we move on and talk about what these specific play themes are toddlers especially those with language delays really respond best to familiar activities that they do in their everyday routines so activities they do often and so remember what did we say about that before so you think right now think about three activities that a toddler would do often in his daily routines so that would be what eating sleeping bathing playing outside going on an outing those kinds of things and so when you are planning even as a parent what are some things that i can pretend to do with my child those are what we need to stick with those are the things that they do first then they move on as they get a little older and we talked about with typically developing kids this is happening between 18 months and 24 months they start to copy things that they see you do often and they expand their play to that so not only do we think about pretending to eat and sleep and take a bath and go outside and play or go somewhere that we go all the time they're also now adding things like cooking and cleaning and taking care of children or uh or cutting the grass or working on a car, whatever they would see a, a parent do there. So that's the next little uh, round of activities or next kind of play that we can expect a toddler to do and that we can facilitate even in our toddlers with language delays. And then after that would come activities that they do less frequently. So going, going to the doctor or going to the pool or going on vacation or uh, a, maybe if you're if their grandparents live out of town going on an out of town trip to see their grandparents or going to the zoo so sometimes those kinds of things again we take a kid who's just barely giving a baby doll a bite and thinking oh he's pretending to do that he he fed this little bear just great during the assessment fantastic this week we're going to pretend like we're, we're, we're going to do zoo play we're going to He's not there yet. That's my point. And so I wanted you to think about that hierarchy and that sequence with kids too, especially with, with toddlers with language delays. We start with activities they do often, then activities that they see you do often, and then the less familiar activities. All right, so let's go ahead now and talk about what were the five best play themes uh, for preschoolers and let me just give you this list and again it's on your handout if you want to take a list at that look at that and so the first one is restaurant play and this would be any kind of uh, pretending that you are ordering food from the child or whoever if you're the person you're going to think about your sequences you're going to order the food somebody's going to prepare the food bring the food out to the diner or the guest the person's going to eat the food and then uh if if you're going beyond that if a child is ready for that maybe pay for the food and then leave so that that is kind of the crux of whatever whether you're playing restaurant or ice cream shop pizza shop uh lemonade stand anything like that that's kind of that's kind of your o an overall reaching thing and for some of you who are slps and even if you're just working in early intervention maybe some of your uh, kids who are doing really really well that you your kids who are almost three they're not quite ready to discharge you're not letting them go but maybe these could be ideas that you think oh this would be a good idea for me for therapy or this would be something good to talk to mom about how we can bump up uh, the things that they play at home or even even just so that mom supports that play better with buying some different materials or, or playing with the child to kind of get them started so that they have practice with that play at home because you're going to play uh, that in therapy and you certainly want to be carrying over those activities uh, and teaching parents to play these things at home too not just to get them ready to play for you in therapy but just for their own um their own practice at home and their own interaction together so restaurant is a good one the second one that was on this list was birthday party playing birthday party is huge and that's something that uh, for all those years that i did home visits and even uh, in our clinic anytime a child has a birthday coming up you really want to play birthday party that's something fun to play it gives them uh, that experience so that they are ready for that maybe they haven't gone to birthday parties very often and for some kids who have gone to a lot of birthday parties it's just one of their favorite things to play and so if that's not something that you've played lately uh, that you can think about that now I always play birthday party uh, with play-doh we're making our own uh, birthday cake and we'll get into the sequences and, and that sort of thing but I just wanted to mention that to you as well as some 
some just for ideas sometimes you you might not be thinking about these and you may be looking for a way to make your very stale therapy routines a little bit more exciting so adding some of these things would be real fun the third one that's on the list for preschoolers is playing apples so picking apples or orchard you could probably include pumpkins with that because that's something a lot of we have a lot of field trips in the fall to do right go pick pumpkins if you live in an area where uh, you can do that and where pumpkins are a rural area that you can get there but that's the third theme the fourth one like i've already mentioned is pet shop so having uh taking care of pets like dogs and cats and so the grooming that would go with that pretending you're giving them a haircut uh, giving them a bath feeding them taking care of them until uh either if you're playing pet shop like somebody's going to come by the pet or maybe the groomer come back and get their pet that would be real fun and then the last preschool theme here was doctor or vet all right so i've already told you this at the beginning of the show so i started looking at those play themes and thinking that's fantastic that's just great i love those ideas but again not all of our little friends who are on our early intervention caseloads as toddlers can do that kind of advanced play so i started looking at those themes and thinking what can i do to get those kids ready so for restaurant what would it be so how about playing with a kitchen set or any kind of food prep that we were talking about or cleaning up so that would be what leads to that kind of play so as an early interventionist i've got to get my kids ready i've got i've got to i've got to provide that those play foundations and those language foundations so that those kinds of things make sense and so that's what we think about with restaurants so then then i thought okay well that's our first little toddler play theme here it's kitchen some kind of food prep kind of thing and so then i did the same thing with birthday party and so what did you what would you think about that what would be kind of a play that would come before you played birthday party well it would be the same sort of thing it would be kind of taking care of children or feeding children like we do with uh, the cake at a birthday party which is kind of usually what that sequence is right for a birthday party uh, you you prep the cake you think about the presents then people come to the party you sing happy birthday the child blows out the candle you pretend you eat the cake and for a lot of toddlers that's it that's that's kind of the whole or an, an older toddler a preschooler you could of course add different steps for that but when I'm thinking about toddlers I think about okay well baby dolls and okay that sort of is similar again to that theme that we have with restaurants with pretending we're going to cook or make food so uh, that's where we go with that uh, what about apples or the orchard what would be kind of that step down for a toddler play theme there it would be farm right or zoo or playing with some kind of animals and that leads us to the next one which was pet shop and so we think about that any kind of little play with animals that would be real fun for a toddler and think about you can't really have a four-year-old with a language delay play pet shop when he's never really played these other things first and so as a preschool slp you may that may be one of the problems that you're having with children you're using themes that are just too mature they don't have enough language or uh, their play skills aren't developed enough for that to really make sense to them yet and so again we talked about how uh, our fifth consideration for choosing a good play theme here was what that we could simplify and expand it and so for those kids that are really struggling you think oh this is just too hard you got to back up and really pull these themes way down and of course with doctor or vet we could certainly um, you know think about that with playing with baby dolls or even even going to the doctor as a toddler and pretending to go to the doctor as a toddler is going to look a lot different probably than a preschooler who would pretend that but again we've got to start somewhere and we've got to make sure that we are providing that foundation to uh, so that a kid can expand his language and his play together so i think those are some pretty good play themes for toddlers and preschoolers so now what we're going to do is walk through that criteria that we talked about earlier and we're going to match it with the things that we talked about so with the kitchen and the baby dolls and the house uh, the playground and the farm and so this is what we do in therapy again with kids when they've moved through like we talked about with stages of play when they've met they're not doing exploratory play anymore and non-functional play and we didn't really define that but those are activities with toys and objects that support um, cognitive concepts like cause and effect so cause and effect toys or object permanence or simple problem solving like shape sorters and puzzles and ring stackers and then beginning functional play when we bump up to that that's going to be where kids learn to use uh, their familiar toys and so 
and use them for what they were intended to be. And so again, sometimes we go fat, too fast with kids in early intervention and they're stuck and they're not moving forward. And it's because we're just trying to bump them up too, too high with uh, language skills and uh, play themes that are too complicated for them. And so we have to bump that back down. But sometimes our kids in EI, again, we are selling them short. We're not making it fast enough or fun enough. So for those kids, we need to, need to uh, bump up. So let's apply all of this information that we have just spent almost an hour talking about so far with uh, what our criteria was. Now I've provided a page for this for you already in your handout and then I've given you a blank one <laughs> so that you can copy it or print it and then uh, be able to use it as you're thinking about your kids, especially your hard kids, especially your kids that we talked about. Hey, they've been playing this kind of beginning functional play forever it is time to bump it up with these kids and so this is going to help you and especially you know for some of our kids on our caseload this is easy we can do this and those are the kids that you've already done it with this is really going to help you when you have kids that you just are not sure what's going on you're not sure why your sessions aren't more successful you're not sure why they're not staying with you you're just not sure and so i i think that this tool and by using this exercise you're going to be able to discover some things especially for the, those harder kids so look at your handout so i took that first uh, maybe it's not the first, but I took one of our themes, baby dolls, and kind of did this and sort of walked through what we talked about. And so listed the theme, which is baby dolls, and then we listed our props. And I think this might also be a really good exercise for you to do with parents so that they can really see sometimes sort of what they're missing or why their play at home isn't as successful as it could be. You know, maybe they don't have enough stuff <laughs> or maybe they're not using their toys like they could be to promote uh, better language development or just you know and and you know I'm using a lot of real technical words but what I would really say to a parent is you don't have enough to talk about y'all don't have enough to play with here so you know let, let's go let's go look in the toy box let's find some different stuff here and so when you're listing your props right there you know, that, that's going to be uh, just very, very obvious when, uh, and even for you as a therapist, you know, you may be trying to uh, do everything on a cons as a consultative model and not ever have the luxury of taking your own toys in. And again, that's okay, but you've got to think about your activities ahead of time. What am I going to do with this kid's house? What are we going to do? These sessions have not been productive enough. I feel like I'm just talking to mom while she drinks her coffee and that's all we're doing during therapy. You don't want it to be like that. So even using this kind of tool to think about a, uh, your your kid's house that you're going to go to would be a good exercise there. So first we did our props, so those are our materials. And then secondly, we what was our first factor that we said that made a play theme good? It would be sequences. So we write out what the sequences are. And so with baby dolls, what would our sequences be? Uh, our, or our first thing, like baby eat. So what do we need to do for the baby to eat? simplistically for a toddler who's not talking very much who this is just the very beginning of kind of playing uh, with us with this so what what would our order be for a baby to eat well we need a prop so we need some way to prepare a food so some kind of prop so we need either what a doll a baby doll bottle or a cup or a bowl or a spoon we need something and then so that's the beginning is the kid gets the food ready and then what's the middle he's going to give the doll a bite or a drink right and then what's the end you know he might do the middle a lot and then you're all done you know you clean up you wipe the baby's mouth whatever is your ending thing even if it's just saying all done that kind of thing so think about that and think about okay that's what we would do for that what what about our next familiar activity what would a sequence be that you could get a good beginning middle and end for a child's familiar activity what about sleeping what do we need to do to make the baby doll sleep and so you know we talked about that when we gave that example we're going to put the baby doll down down, the baby doll's you know going to pretend that he's asleep and then the baby doll's going to wake up and again these are ways that we can use the factors just to kind of determine what we're going to do during play and again this gives a lot of parents uh, ideas sometimes uh, I've had parents that say to me you know I'm just not really good at coming up with things to do during play so we really only do the kind same kinds of things that you do during therapy well 
talk about pressure. <laughs> that puts a lot of pressure on us, right, to c- try to come up with uh, ideas that we can model for parents. And so that's what we should be doing. And for some of our parents, we really should be walking through this kind of tool with them so that they can see this is how we plan this. This is what we do. This is how we come up with how we plan our sessions, right? And so you think about for a kid who's having a lot of difficulty playing, uh, this would be a really, really important step to do. Next, we list out, uh, and again, so for baby dolls, I have baby eats, baby sleeps baby takes a bath or baby goes bye-bye and remember what we said about that that we're going to try to pick familiar everyday activities at the beginning so that uh so that it makes sense for a toddler with a language delay next we were going to do what what did we save as the next factor it's vocabulary development so when i think about playing and i've already told you how i do this um is i just look at the props that i have and sort of fill in you know what are my potential for new nouns here and then i think oh my goodness all these words are too hard i'm not going to be able to we're we're playing baby doll sleeps today but she really can't say blanket you know i'm gonna i'm gonna model that for her but that's kind of a word that i think is Genetically complex, and she's not going to be able to do that. Let me kind of stick with, you know, what what am I going to focus? What are my uh, vocabulary targets going to be here? And for some kids, you know, it just might be for sleeping, you know, night night and uh, shh or wake up, you know, kind of a holistic phrase there. And so you walk through this, and that's how you think about vocabulary development. And I already gave you that other idea of taking a list of, you know, common words that toddlers use. And I told you I have a list in every one of my therapy manuals. So if you already own one of those, go back and kind of find the list in that book and copy it for yourself. Uh, You know, and I I just, I I start thinking about what words could we teach here, not only with this activity, but what uh, words would that child be missing? All right, so that was our second factor there with vocabulary development. And then we looked at how can we combine play and language together. So on this sheet, I made you some little notes. So what were what would be some things that we would be looking at with combining play? So can this child, what motor skills does this child need for play task? And so if we're looking at baby dolls, it might be stirring with a spoon. And so you think, well, can a kid imitate that? Can he physically do that? I mean, there will be some of our little friends who uh, developmentally if they have a lot of motor issues say a kid with cerebral palsy not going to be able to do that and so we would know or or can't do that yet so we would think oh my goodness i'm going to be working on that motor skill today too with this and so you list out what your motor motor skills are so it might be giving a baby a drink with a cup or pushing a baby doll stroller Uh, and then another uh little area that we look at with play skills, learning to use familiar toys and objects for their their intended purpose. And we talked about this with functional play. Can the child, does he know that I cover up the baby with a blanket? Does she know to put the hat on the baby doll's head? And again, most of our kids in early intervention will already know this, but some of our little guys won't. And so we're going to be thinking about, hey, I'm teaching that. I'm teaching teaching this more functional play. Uh, Another play skill that we look at that certainly comes in when children are learning to, like we said before, with combining words, they're going to be combining toys during play. So can they combine objects? Uh, A lot of times we'll see, we'll set out a lot of toys in front of a kid and let's just use our example here with baby dolls and we'll see that the, they don't really do anything together they pick up the spoon they pretend they eat with the spoon or really they're licking the spoon putting it in their mouth putting it back down then they pick up the cup and pretend to give themselves a drink with the cup they're not really offering you a cup they're not trying to give their bear or any other little character there a drink they're just kind of staying there with themselves and remember what we said about that kids who aren't combining objects or ideas in play aren't going to combine words either and so they that for a lot of our kids, we need to teach them how to join ideas first. And so that would be a play skill that we're working on. And then certainly another play skill that we're talking about is pretend, as we teach pretending, early pretending. And our classic example of that is object substitution or representational play. That would be where a kid picks up a block and pretends that it's a phone or the block is a cookie or they're doing some kind of real pretending. And so we as SLPs, when we have our little guys that we're working with, that's one of the things that we need to be doing when we're playing with them. If we don't see a lot of object substitution or that representational play going on, we need to do that. We need to give them opportunities and we need to plan that. And that's why a tool like this is going to really help you because you'll be able to consider it. The relationships, remember that was our next factor. So what are relationships with baby dolls? Somebody's, you know, going to be the mom or the dad if you're playing with a baby doll. Now, let me just say um, about this too, a lot of our our preschool pretend play themes were more advanced in that the children are really completing or or being uh, always 
uh, there there are just more roles there, and sometimes we don't we don't think about that with toddlers, like we said. And so, uh, remember the example we said before that when a little boy is playing with a baby doll, sometimes we don't say, "You're the daddy, you're the daddy," and that might make uh, play <clears throat> pretending and and getting into this kind of conversational interactive back and forth a lot easier. And then lastly, I have written on your tool here on your sheet, what are ways to simplify and expand? And so simplification is always reducing what children are doing, reducing our demands on them, simplifying their props, taking things away. And it might be just that, again, like with restaurant or these higher uh, higher uh, preschooler themes, you're going to maybe back that down to that toddler theme rather than the preschool schooler theme. And then the other way with expansion, you know, I've got some ideas down here too. So I hope that you'll take a look at this for your handout, or I hope this will, this will make you want to get the handout so that you can look at this and think about how you can walk through uh, these uh, characteristics and really, really, really make your play uh, a lot more effective in your speech therapy sessions. So I've given you a lot of information today. And again, I hope that you can uh, take this information and really, really use it, especially with your hard kids, especially with your kids that, you know, maybe, maybe you have a, another therapist friend or a mentor that you call and you say, I don't know why this didn't work. Or if you are the mentor, <laughs> or if you are the supervisor, or the boss at wherever you work, and you have other therapists that are coming to you, this kind of tool would be fantastic for them to help uh, a more, uh, a newer therapist, a less experienced therapist, see how to really organize these themes. Or like I said before, uh, with, with moms and dads who are saying, hey, this just is not working for us at home, maybe walking through this tool would be a good exercise for you to do in this, uh, in your next session with them to help make that more effective. All right, so if you need some more ideas for play, I want to talk to you about the two therapy manuals that I've referenced today. Uh, this one is Teach Me to Talk, the therapy manual. It takes every language milestone, both receptive and expressive, below 12 months all the way up to 48 months and gives you the milestone or the goal plus several activities that you can do. So if you are an SLP and don't have this book, this would be a great uh, addition to your own library. And then this therapy manual is called Let's Talk About Talking, Ways to Strengthen the 11 Skills All Toddlers Master Before Words Emerge. So if you have a kid that you're parenting or a kid that you're working with as their therapist and you have no idea why they're not talking yet, there's, that kid is just a big puzzle and you just have are just at your wit's end with needing answers, get this book because it will help you figure out what pieces are missing and it walks through so many of the little play ideas that we talked about today that I used as examples. So those would be great ideas for you. All right, that's all for today. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast from Teach Me to Talk. Oops.